What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here of a reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the funders and the principals and associates of this great open source organization. Today, newsletter number 44 on April 30th, 2019. This week's newsletter sees another slow news week, but does not contain our regular, or sorry, but it does contain our regular section on back 32 standing support, selected questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange, and the notable changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action item: none at the time of writing. Note, if the Bitcoin Core release team are satisfied that no blocking issues were found in the fourth release candidate distributed last week, they intend to tag the final release for version 0.18 around this time this newsletter is being published. If that happens, we'll provide details release coverage in next week's newsletter. But please do not wait on us if you plan to upgrade. Everything you need to know about the new version is explained in its release notes, which will be published with or linked to as part of the various release announcements on the different platforms such as BitcoinCore.org. News, none this week. We hope everyone is enjoying a lovely spring, fall, or dry season. BEC32 sending support. Week 7 of 24. Until the second anniversary of the SegWit soft fork lock-in on August 24th, 2019, the Optech newsletter will contain this weekly section to provide information to help developers and organizations implement BAC32 sending support yourself. But if you, or this does not require you implementing SegWit yourself, but it does allow the people you pay to access all of SegWit's multiple benefits. It's said that imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. And in this week's section, we take a quick look at a few other systems that are using variations of BAC32. If you are already going to need to implement something that's basically BAC32 for another project, it's probably worth your time to implement it for Bitcoin too. The Lightning Network Invoices uses the BEC32 format with an extended human readable part, HRP, and without BEC32's normal 90 character limit, see Bolt 11 for the full specification. As an example, here is a Lightning Network Invoice. Bitcoin Cash New Style Addresses uses the BEC32 format with the human readable part, Bitcoin Cash, and the separator with a semicolon. Instead of the version byte encoded, a SegWit witness version, as in Bitcoin, it indicates whether the hash encoded by the address should be used with pay to public key hash or pay to script hash. See the spec cache address for full specification. Example, Bitcoin cash, <coughs> Bcash, semicolon with this gibberish. The backup seed. In June 2018, Jonas Schnelli proposed BEC32X, a scheme to encode Bitcoin private keys, extended private keys, X privates, and extended public keys, X pubs, using the BEC32 the BAC for error correction. See the full draft specification and this example of PK1 and a bunch of gibberish. Elements based sidechains. Sidechains based on the elementproject.org, such as Blockstream's Liquid, use both BEX32 addresses and a variation of them called BLEC32 address. BLEC32 address are intended for use with the platform's confidential assets and will soon be supported by the Explorer Block Explorer for the Liquid sidechain. We're unaware of a specification document for BLEC32, but this code is labeled as a reference implementation and is cited elsewhere in the project as cliquidaddress.python for command or compact difference from BEC32 examples. Examples of the BEC32 address is lq1q and a bunch of gibberish. Output script descriptors. Although 
less directly related to back 32 checksums based on the same bose jaduri hokogangam bch uh, codes used in back 32 were added to the output script descriptors supported by bitcoin core see peter woolley's detailed comment and example of wpkh uh, and this bunch of gibberish <laughs> Selected Q&A from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Bitcoin Stack Exchange is one of the first places Optech contributors look for answers to their questions or when we have a few spare moments of time to help curious or confused users. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. The first question, do hash time lock contracts work for micropayments? David Harding and Gregory Maxwell both point out that there is risk in having an output with too small of an amount to be spent on chain while the payment is being routed. A micropayment of less than 546 satoshis would not be relayed by the Bitcoin network. And the current mitigation is for Lightning Network to temporarily move such payments to be a minor fee instead of an output. Depending on the game theory that if an attacker cannot steal money, they will not spend money to attack. And here the question asked by, uh, by Chris Chen and edited by Merch. I read this tweet by Tash Dreija recently. What exactly did he mean? Is this an issue? If so, is this issue fixable? And the quote here is, hash time lock contracts do not work for micropayments below transaction fee level. Uh, though single Satoshi payments can be securely made within a channel, pretending one Satoshi HTLCs are a thing is setting people up to be disappointed. And here we have a detailed answer, or oh, a very detailed answer, by David Harding. It takes about 200 virtual bytes to spend from a Lightning Network hashed time lock contract output used for routing payments. As a default minimum fee rate of 10 nano bitcoins per virtual byte, this makes it uneconomical to attempt, uh, uh, to, attempt to claim a routed micropayment below about 2 nano bitcoins, which is below 0 0.8 US dollar cents at a 4,000 US dollar to Bitcoin price. As fees rise, larger and larger micropayments become uneconomical to claim. Worse, the default Bitcoin Core mempool policy attempts to prevent UTXO set bloat attacks by refusing to relay or mine any transaction containing an output that would be uneconomical to spend at a fee rate of 30 nanobits per virtual byte. This is uh, called the dust limit. To obey the limit, Lightning Network nodes must not include the hash time lock contracts for every small micropayment in Lightning Network off-chain transactions. Otherwise, those transactions could not be confirmed on-chain if necessary, and other values in the channel could be stolen by a counterparty. Currently, when Lightning Network nodes are asked to route a payment below the dust limit, they trim those hash time lock contracts by increasing the potential transaction fee of their channel by this amount of the micropayment rather than adding an HTLC. This fee only actually pays miners if the channel is closed in a state that includes this fee. By mutual agreement between channel counterparties, the fee can be removed in a later state. This creates three possible outcomes. One, the fee is removed in a later state because both peers agree that the micropayment completed successfully. So the amount is transferred into a normal size output that is not subject to the dust limit. Two, the fee is removed in a later state because both peers agree that the micropayment failed. Either it was rejected or it timed out. The earlier state where the funds were held in a larger output is restored. The two peers get into a disagreement about the payment and close the channel. In this case, the funds are actually transferred to the miner and they are lost to whichever channel party was technically 
correct about the final payment state. Peter Risen has argued that combining uh, with Bitcoin's transaction fees, this can lead to, quote, the problem where even $50 payments are not, quote unquote, trustless. In the case where $50 is below the dust threshold, then HTLCs cannot be used to protect the $50 payment. Customers can lose $50 payments through no fault of their own. And then continuing with David Harding, it seems like he might be correct, although there are a few evasions we could make about the current network behavior. One, the amounts involved is currently tiny, about $2 at the 4,000 US dollar Bitcoin price. Two, node operators who want to eliminate their risk can simply refuse to route micropayments below the dust limit. And three, those willing to accept the limited risk can limit their maximum exposure, for example, only routing up to 10 payments below $0.2 for the maximum risk of 20 cents. However, uh, what, we, uh, what we really want is a fundamental solution to this risk, a way to make even microtransactions trustless. Happily, the person quoted in the question at Tadeusz Raija uh, one of the original Lightning Network architects previously described how this might be accomplished. And now Harding continues. Removing trust from inexpressible values. Above, we described micropayments below the dust limit, which is a relay and mining policy, and meaning it can be changed without needing global consensus. However, Lightning Network also allows micropayments down to 10 pet Peter Bitcoin, which is one one thousandth of the consensus enforced uh, one Satoshi maximum pre precision, precision of on chain. When a channel contains some value that cannot be represented on chain, the remaining value is tracked in a database and Lightning Network commitments are made using rounding. For example, if six Satoshis paid or 0 0.6 Satoshis paid from Alice's side of the channel to Bob's side of the channel, uh, she might actually send him uh, one Satoshi in an off chain transaction and uses the extra for 0 0.4 Satoshis. And they are tracked in a database to be credited towards subsequent payments. If the channel is closed at this point, Alice accepts that she's going to lose those 0 0.4 Satoshis which is a tiny amount. Given this tiny amount involved, that seems like a preferable, a perfectly satisfactory solution. Bob is unlikely to pay an on-chain fee uh, of 4,000 nano Bitcoin just to steal four nano Bitcoin from Alice. But in early Lightning Network presentations, Dreyja proposed an alternative technique based on something occasionally discussed among Bitcoin protocol developers the probabilistic payments. Probabilistic payments are payments that only succeed a specified percentage of times. For example, Alice wants to pay Bob one nano Bitcoin, but that's smaller than allowed by Bitcoin. Instead, she offers him a probabilistic payment of 10 nano Bitcoin, the smallest Bitcoin does allow, with one in 10 odds. Nine times of 10, Bob gets nothing. One time in 10, he gets 10 nano bitcoins. If this is done with a provably fair protocol and a distribution amount are symmetric to the odds, that is, there is no house edge, then there is reasonable to believe that receiving 10 nano bitcoin one tenth of the time is equivalent to receiving one nano bitcoin each time. The exact mechanism described by Treasure is complicated and I do not know how well it's been reviewed for security. A large problem faced by all ideas for probabilistic payments on Bitcoin is that they are hard or impossible to implement in Bitcoin's very limited script language. Sidechains based on the Elements project, such as Blockstream's Liquid, have re-enabled some disabled math opcodes from Bitcoin, plus added the op deterministic random opcode that makes probabilistic payments much easier to implement these there. Although I'm unaware of any specific work on a defining uh, definite protocol, uh, 
Perhaps someday, these opcodes or other similar features will become available on Bitcoin if there is a community demand for them. He continues with probabilistic payments to circumvent the dust limit. In the previous section, we saw probabilistic payments used to trustlessly get around the minimum consensus position of 10 nanobitcoins. We can use the same mechanism to get around the dust limit trustlessly. If it's uneconomical to spend a HTLC output worth less than 10,000 nanobitcoins, then we simply require probabilistic payments for any amount below that. For example, Alice wants to route a 1,000 nanobitcoin payment through Bob, and Bob requires her to create an HTLC paying himself 10,000 bitcoins with a 1 in 10 chance of success. Then the Lightning Network is, proce uh, is pro pro processed. Oh yeah. <laughs> if both Alice and Bob agree that it failed, they throw away the HTLC. If they both agree that it succeeded, Alice simply adds 10,000 Bitcoin, uh, 1,000 nanobitcoins to a larger output of Bob's circumventing the dust limit. If they disagree on the transaction, needs to go on chain. The probabilistic payment is run and nine times out of 10, Bob receives nothing. Alice gets the 10,000 Bitcoin back. One time out of 10, Bob receives 10,000 nanobitcoins. This can be made completely trustless, provably fair, and does not require any third parties. As mentioned above, probabilistic payments are currently a lot of work to implement on Bitcoin, and effective use of them may rely on a soft fork that are just ideas now. Moreover, while transaction fees are low and Bitcoin valuations still make dust-sized outputs worth just pennies, there is no real need to work on a complex solution to a problem people may be losing a few cents. People who don't want the risk can simply disable routing payments below about two cents. But if this became a real problem, it's a problem I think we can reasonably expect to solve in a completely trustless way. Addendum, an easier, less clever way to circumvent the dust limit. Several hours after posting a description above, it occurred to me that there's an easier way to create trustless payments below the dust limit that does not depend on untested probabilistic payments. If Alice wants to route 10 or 1,000 nanobitcoins payment through Bob, but the minimum economical on-chain HTLC is 10,000 nanobitcoin, she and Bob simply create two off-chain outputs at the same time. One where Alice pays Bob 11,000 nanobitcoin, and one where Bob pays Alice 10,000 nanobitcoin. Both HTLCs use the same hash lock and time lock, so they can both succeed or time out at the same time. The net effect is a 1,000 nanobitcoin payment to Alice if the off chain payment needs to be settled on chain plus the regular ability for them to agree on the outcome and update their main balance cooperatively. Downsides include that this requires that Alice and Bob keep more balance in their side of the channel and they otherwise would in order to handle micropayments and that it costs them more fees overall. The additional burden can be compensated by them charging a higher fee for routing payments below the economical on-chain rate. This method also solves the problem in a completely trustless way, and it's something that should not require significant research to implement, although it is still perhaps a premature optimization while the current risk is measured in pennies. Probabilistic payments are still the only way I know to deal with payments below the minimum on-chain position of one Satoshi, but that's not the question here. Uh, and we have another very detailed answer by Gregory Maxwell. A very low value output in Bitcoin or any similar system has zero actual value because the cost in fees to spend it would be equivalent to or greater than the coins it provides like someone writing you a check of 0.01 US dollar, you'd be best off throwing it off because the time it takes to handle it, much less the tiny risk that it bounces and causes you the bounce check fee, 
is much more valuable than the penny it pays you. The argument being made here is that in a multi-hop lightning payment, during the brief window when payment is being made but has not completed, the participants can sign ephemeral transactions that pay the amount being paid to a new output whose spending is governed by the hash lock. This is needed in order to make the payment atomic, guaranteeing that all hops succeed or all fail. Once the payment is complete, this temporary state is replaced with an update long-term state. This is needed because during that time, each hop's payment of the new incremental amount is conditional. It will pay you this coin only if I got paid that coin. The combination of the two presents presents a challenge. Making a very tiny payment on chain does not make sense because of the cost of eventually using it. So the threat of taking the hash lock intermediate state to the network is essentially an empty threat. Lightning implementations today resolve this by instead making their intermediate state take a tiny payment uh, payment a tiny payments payment and move them to temporarily to fees rather than to an uneconomical output. This creates security through game theory. Breaking the payment would just cause none of the participants to get the tiny amount and an attacker would have to burn quite a bit more in fees to trigger it. Consider that Bitcoin security in general rests on similar game theoretic assumption. This is not at all remarkable. But lightning payments for larger values have much stronger properties such that Bitcoin's consensus is, at least theoretically, the limiting factor in their security by a wide margin. It's worth observing that lightning supports payments down to something like 10 pico Bitcoin, uh, far smaller than the resolution of Bitcoin itself. So the system inherently is always going to have uh, some approximation for very small amounts. But small does not mean that it representable by the blockchain. It also means that it is economically sensible there. I think it's unfortunate that people are talking about dust in this discussion because the dust limit does not rely heavily on the fundamental relevance other than during the low fee periods that limit might artificially increase the cutoff point below which the HTLC output becomes an empty threat. I suspect that if the fee rates had not tanked after the introduction of SegWit implementations, probably would have removed the dust limit policy rules in any case. There are a clutch that comp compensates for fees being too low to dissuade various antisocial behavior, like spamming for adversaries' um, purposes or de-anonymizing users and do not say, uh, serve much purpose if the fee rates are consistently high enough to discourage these attacks. I am not sure if any of the more modern Lightning Network protocol work like L2 changes this trade-off, as I do not think most people working on Lightning Network have even given it much thought. The existent incentives for very small payments seem reasonable enough. This consideration also does not apply to a single hop payment. They are limited only by the channel amount and the representative increments between the amounts. Though I doubt any Lightning Network implementation makes use of the fact, given that they do not seem to think it is especially interesting. Well, thank you very much for Gregory Maxwell and, of course, David Harding for answering this, uh, well, seemingly quick question in a very long form. Jumping back into the newsletter to question number two. How was the dust limit of 546 Satoshis chosen? And why not 550 Satoshis? The Bitcoin Core transaction relay policy set a dust limit of 546 Satoshis as the minimum amount for an output, which seems a peculiar amount. Raghav Sood describes how 546 is three times the minimum cost to create and spend a pay to witness, sorry, pay to public key hash output. A reference is made to a 2013 discussion. And here we have the question of MCCS. Is there a reason why 546 Satoshis was chosen as a dust limit instead of 547? 
or even 550 Satoshis historically? And we have this answer by Raghav Sood, edited by Kappa Dev. The dust limit is not actually fixed, technically. It varies based on the type of output. 546 Satoshis is simply the most commonly known one for a pay-to-public key hash output. Being the longest-lived output type, I suspect some wallet slash blog posts slash literature might treat it as a hard-coded dust limit. As to how it arrived at 546 Satoshis, we must first know what dust means. A dust output is an output which costs more to spend than it is worth. In other words, an X Bitcoin output costs larger than X to spend, is a dust output. This is directly proportional to the amount of data required to spend an output. Since fees in Bitcoin are commonly denoted per byte, the more bytes you must have to pay uh, to your transaction to spend an output, the higher its dust threshold. A very basic transaction, considering of one pay-to-public key hash input, which is roughly 148 bytes, and one pay-to-public key hash output, which is roughly 34 bytes, comes into 182 bytes. The dust limit is three times this number, assuming a fee relay fee of one Satoshi, or uh, 182 times 3 equals 546 Satoshis. For more complex transactions, such as pay to script hash, this number is larger. For a less space intensive one, such as the newer SegWit outpoints, uh, this number would be lower. The code used in Bitcoin Core determines the dust threshold can be found here. Well, thank you very much, Raghav, for the very interesting answer to MCCCS's question. And now jumping back into the newsletter to question three, history of the transactions in the Lightning Network. A Lightning Network beginner asks how the history of transactions conducted on Lightning Network for a user can be saved and how a payer receiver receives a proof of payment. Mark H., uh, responds saying that L Lightning Network wallets would need to save transaction history for a user and provides a nice explanation of how a payment hash provided to a payer results in a pre payment pre image reveals the serves as a proof of payment. And here the question by Duka Hung The history of Lightning Network transactions. I'm just a beginner in the Lightning Network and have some questions about transactions in Lightning Network when I'm doing the research. One, transactions in Lightning Network are off-chain, so transactions could not be stored in the main chain. So how could you look up the transaction history? And two, payment channels is private for someone outside. And if there is no transaction history, how do I give the information to others to prove that I've just made a payment in Lightning Network? And we have this question here, or the answer by Mark H. To the first question, you cannot view the transaction history of any node except your own. Transactions in Lightning Network are private and sent encrypted over an onion routing layer. It is up to the software client to keep track of payments if you want your own payment history. And to the second question, every payment on Lightning Network uses a 256-bit random number called a payment pre-image. The pre-image is hashed using SHA-256 to produce a payment hash. The intended recipient of funds initially withholds the payment pre-image, but gives you the payment hash and asks you to make the payment. When you make the payment, it is made for a specific payment hash. This is done with hashed time-locked contracts with the conditional payment the payment expires after a timeout unless the intended recipient accepts the payment by surrendering the payment pre-image for the payment hash. If the recipient does not accept the payment, they must fail the HTLC before the timeout, else their channel may be forcibly closed and they will not receive the payment. Once the recipient has accepted a payment by sending the payment pre-image, it is trivial for you to prove that you had a payment hash because anyone can perform a SHA-256 
on the pre-image and assert that it matches the payment hash. The assumption here is that SHA-256 is cryptographically secure and it is not possible to brute force a payment pre-image to produce an expected payment hash. By surrendering the payment pre-image to accept the payment, the recipient has provided proof that you have paid. Note that this must assume that the pre-image is never reused and every payment must use a unique random pre-image, else it may be possible that funds are stolen. Uh, thanks for the great answer, Mark H., and thanks for the good question, Dukan HG. Back to the newsletter, reading question four. How can a private key be revealed if I use the same knots while generating the signature? Peter Woolley provides a thorough answer that, if you are familiar with the math used in public key cryptography, demonstrates how a private key is revealed in such circumstances. And here, the question by... Ugam Kamat. I know it is well understood that it is not a good practice to use the same nonce while generating the signature, but I'm not getting the math right. Assume I have some UTXOs that are controlled by my private key, Q. Say I have spent two of the UTXOs using the nonce N to generate my signature. Now that the R and S components of the signature are public and the transactions are public. So everyone has access to them. That will be signature one being N to the power of minus one times the hash of the message one times Q times R mod P. And for S2, we have N to the power of minus one times the hash of message two times Q times R uh, plus or mod P. And then we have S1 minus S2 equals n to the power of one minus one times the hash of message one minus the hash of message two modular p. Even though we know that S1 and S2 and M1 and 2 M2, it is not solving for n to the power of minus two and hence n both equivalently to finding the solution to discrete logarithm. And we have here the good answer by Peter Woolley. Let me rewrite your question in a different notation where all lowercase values are integers and uppercase values are points. The group generator is G, a known constant. The private key is lowercase q. Its corresponding public key is large scale q equals smaller scale q uh, times G. The nonce is N and its corresponding point is r equals n to the generator point. The x coordinate is r and small r, or of, r, of large r is small r. The hash function is hash of x. A signature is r and s, where s is computed as n to the power of minus one times the hash uh, of the message and q and r. The signature is valid if r equals x times s to the power of minus one and the hash of the message of the generator point plus uh, r times q. Now for the two signatures, it holds that uh, s1 equals n to the power of one times the hash of message one times private key times r. And S2 is n to the power of minus one times the hash of the message two plus the private key plus R. Uh, and S1 minus S2 equals n to the power of minus one times the hash of message one minus the hash of message two. And n is S1 minus S2 to the power of minus one times the hash of message one minus the hash of message two. As S1 and S2 are just integers, S1 minus S2 to the power of minus one can be trivially computed using a modular inverse. There are no elliptic curve points involved here over which the problem would be hard. And once you know N, you can find the private key by rewriting the first equation where N times S1 equals the hash of message one times the private key times R and N times S1 minus the hash of message one equals the private key times R, and then the private key equals 
r to the power of minus one times n times s1 minus the hash of message one. Isn't it fun to read math formulas aloud? Well, thank you, Peter Woolley, for answering uh, this very compelling question and showing how you can actually reveal the private key. Back into the newsletter for the fifth question, why do Lightning Network invoices expire? Rene Picard guesses that the primary reason would be the high volume recipients with relatively low storage capability could run out of storage or memory. An additional reason given is to provide some closure to proceed if a payment is not initiated or completed, rather than leave it dangling. David Harding points out that traditional businesses put expiring dates on invoices to avoid an obligation to deliver goods in the future at a previously offered price. And here we have the question. Um, Oh, yeah. We have a question by Enrique Alcazar and edited by Merch. I'm considering the development of a Lightning Network app, and I'm trying to make it non-custodial. I was thinking on pre-generating invoices for all users every X time to make things simpler. To do this, I would need to extend the expiry date. I tried to look up why do Lightning invoices expire, and I could not find a clear answer. So why do Lightning Networks expire, uh, have an expiry date? And is it to ensure that they are not kept forever in a receiver database? Or is it there any other reason? We have here the first answer by Rene. The bold 11, which specifies invoices, does not give a rationale for that design choice. Therefore, unless one of the people who build it comes along, I can only give an educated guess. So first, all of these invoices were valid for an arbitrary time. The recipient would have to keep an arbitrary amount of pre-image running eventually into memory, hard drive disk or hard disk issues. I guess this is the single most important reason. As another one, lighting payments and routing with HTLCs is an atomic procedure. It either works or it doesn't. Given a constrained time bound, you can decide afterwards for sure what the result was. If the expiry is arbitrary, it could always be the case that the payment has just not been initiated yet. Last, I can imagine that sending notes would eat up hedge time locks contract and the recipients uh, might have already deleted the pre-image without expiry time. In this case, the network also has a unnecessary load. Excited to see if there are other pop-up and excellent questions. And mm -hmm. where do we have to hear? Yeah, from David Harding in the comments. Another reason is that even non-Bitcoin businesses put expirations on their traditional currency invoices, so they are not obligated to deliver goods in the future at the price they offered in the past. With digital currencies, this is even more important because of the exchange rate volatility. Thank you both for answering this very compelling question. Back into the newsletter for the very last Bitcoin Stack Exchange question. Are there still miners or mining pools which refuse to implement SegWit? Mark Earhart provides extensive analysis demonstrating that essentially the answer is no. Only 0.03% non-empty blocks from the past year had no SegWit transaction. And the two primary miners of those three blocks have demonstrated in 2019 that they are mining blocks with SegWit transactions. Here the question asked by this user. It was well known that initially while SegWit got more than 50% of hash rate after activation, that a part of the mining pools refused to implement it. But are there still blocks being mined by miners which refuse to implement SegWit more than two years later? For example, this article or this article is still true. And we have this oh, very nice answer by Merch. Okay, no. In the past year, there were only 15 non-empty, non-sequit blocks mined, which account for less than 0.03% of all blocks. Non-empty blocks without sequit transactions are these right here. And we can see they are from, of course, Bitcoin.com and Bitcoin Russia. I've looked up the last 20 blocks that confirmed transactions, but did not include any SegWit data. Uh, 
The newest one was mined in 2018 on December 18th, uh, more than four months ago. The 21st blog in the series was mined on 2018, March 13th, at height 530,267. Given that we're currently at five, height 573,220, there were only 20 non-empty blocks that did not include SegWit transactions among the last 59,953 blocks. Or put differently, over a period of time exceeding the past year, there were fewer than 0.034% of non-empty, non-SegWit blocks mined. The two known miners that created such blocks without SegWit transactions appear to not be doing that now. Bitcoin's Russia last 10 blocks were SegWit blocks, which we see here, and Bitcoin.com's last 10 blocks were also SegWit blocks. Empty blocks. I did not count empty blocks, blocks that contain only a Coinbase transaction, as the Coinbase transaction has no inputs and therefore cannot be a SegWit transaction. However, BIP 144, uh, 141 specifies that the witness commitment is optional if there is no sacred transaction included. Therefore, there is no reliable way to determine whether or not an empty block is sacred or non sacred Thank you very much for this answer, Merch. And now jumping back uh, in the newsletter, if the browser lets me. Okay. Uh, we have here notable code and documentation changes this week in Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, Eclair, Lipsec P256 K1, and the Bitcoin improvement proposals. Note that, unless otherwise noted, all merges described in Bitcoin Core are to its master development branch. Some may also be backported to its pending release. This Bitcoin Core change causes Bitcoin Core to reject transactions submitted via RPC to receive via the peer-to-peer -peer network if they use SegWit-style extended transaction encoding, then they don't include any SegWit inputs. The extended transactions encoding includes a SegWit marker, a SegWit flag, and a witness data fields. Signatures include in legacy inputs do not commit to these fields. So adding the fields to a transaction produce a small waste of bandwidth in a transaction consisting entirely of legacy inputs. For this reason, BIP 144 specified that transactions which do not need the extended format should use the legacy format. Previously, Bitcoin Core accepted in incorrectly formatted transactions and normalize them by stripping out unnecessary SegWit only parts before calculating their size, weight, or relaying them to other peers. Now it will refuse to accept transactions that do not use the appropriate format. This Bitcoin Core change updates the node to accept transactions into its mempool for relaying and mining if any output in the transaction pay SegWit address version 1 through 16. The versions uh, reverted for future protocol upgrades. Previously, such transactions would be rejected. Any money sent to the future version address is not secure, and any miner can spend it until uh, users enforce a soft fork giving that address special meaning similar to the special meaning of SegWit version 0 addresses for a pay-to-witness public key hash and pay-to-witness script hash. That means no one should be using version 1 plus addresses today. However, if anyone does create such an address and asks a SegWit supporting wallet or service to pay it, this change ensures that a transaction will be relayed and mined like any other transaction. A future edition of the newsletter's BEC32 sending support section will go into more depth about the addresses of or for future SegWit versions. And this final eclair change stops sending channel disabled updates each time a node disconnects, but instead only sends them if someone requests the node to route a payment through a channel whose node is disconnected. This prevents notifying the network about channels nobody is actually trying to use. And the pull request makes several other minor changes to how the node handles the network gossip with the aim to reduce the unnecessary traffic. 
peers. You have to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. And again, thank you very much to all the founding sponsors and contributors to this phenomenal open source organization. Thank you very much for joining us here today on the World Crypto Network and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.